one. Good morning, First Baptist Church, Denton. Why are you afraid? That's what our lesson is all about. This is Brother George Tillerson. Just going to share another word with you on our Sunday school lesson. Are you afraid of being in the dark? Are you afraid of the boogeyman? Are you afraid like President Biden was of the cicada that was on his neck? Well, believe me, we've got some talking to do. We're going to be in the books of Matthew 8, Mark 4, and Luke 8. And it is a beautiful day on this side of the world. I'm glad you could join us. Let us pray. Father, be with us this day as we study your word. Bless everyone who can hear my voice. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a concise story about storms in our lives. Jesus and his disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee when a storm rolls in and the wind and waves threatened to destroy the boat while Jesus was what? Jesus was asleep. He was sleeping through the storm. Then Jesus tells the wind, after the disciples were terrified of drowning and they woke him up, Jesus tells the wind and the waves to be still, and they obeyed. You know, <clears throat> storms threaten to destroy our faith. You ever heard of a cartoon character named Foghorn, F-O-G Horn, from back in the day? He would always use a phrase, I say, I say, I say. Well, what if he was the one that was going to wake up Jesus? He would have to say, I say, I say, Jesus, get up. We got a problem up here. When I was in college, I took a poetry class. And one of the poets was Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Brother Dunbar, on one of his poems, it was about a man named Lias. And he would say, Lias, Lias, bless the Lord. Don't you know the day is abroad? If you don't get up, you scamp. There'll be trouble in this camp. Can you hear Paul Lawrence Dunbar in that poem telling Jesus that he needs to get up right now and save him? Well, storms, storms, storms threaten to destroy our faith. And that's what they do sometimes. Storms in our lives. The aim of this lesson is for us to consider the feelings of the disciples when the storm overtook their boat. Jesus was asleep. They've asked us to identify the crisis that causes adults to worry about themselves and their families and to respond to the promised presence of Jesus in bad times as well as the good times. Storms threaten to destroy our faith. The storms in our lives are called trials and tribulations, which sometimes cause us to question our God. The pandemic is slowing down. The masks are coming off. <clears throat> our mandates are being removed. Businesses have reopened. We're trying to return to normal capacities. But people are still dying from the COVID-19 virus. Certainly the numbers are going down, but the news this past week reported over 613,000 people have died from the virus in the United States. And to date, around the world, we're looking at 3.7 million people who have died. That's trials and tribulations. They sometimes cause us to question God. Does it seem like God is asleep? What do we want? Do we want the virus to pass? The disciples wanted the storm to pass. Whatever we're going through in our life, we too want it to pass. We ask for healing. We ask for relief. We ask for reconciliation, for help, so that the storms in our lives will pass. There are four verses 
that I enjoy reading very much that talk about trials and tribulations. I'm just going to read them to you real quick. The first one is James, <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And it says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. <coughs> Excuse me. So he wants us to count it all joy. Romans 5, 3 through 6, and I'm just going to read a part of it, said that we should glory in tribulation, also knowing that tribulation works patience. Patience, experience, and hope. 2 Timothy 2 3 says, Thou therefore should endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And one of my favorites is Psalm 119 71. It says, It is good that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, which is his word. It's good that we go through trials and tribulations. It makes us, it helps us to focus on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, our storms can really be real to us. They can be terrifying to us to the point that we have to exert all of our strength just to survive. My brother-in-law, Brother Tim, 17 years ago, he was here in Virginia visiting us with my sister and the, and the, and the young kids. I think they were just two then, my niece and nephew. And he had a fall when we were over in Virginia Beach. And has been in a wheelchair ever since. But one thing about my brother Tim, and he understood this after much prayer, is that God had more work for him to do. His business now is very, very productive and successful. He is now mayor of Bowie, Maryland. And presently, he's running for controller in Merlin. His motto is, is to walk by faith and not by sight. So does Jesus care that we're suffering? To the point, this point is not just surviving a storm, but knowing who is in your boat. We got to know who's beside us. What's his name? His name is Jesus. What's his name? We call him Jesus the Christ. What's his name? He is God Almighty. He handles all this on his own. So we're going to go and look at the verses in Matthew 8, and we're going to refer back to Mark and Luke. So in Matthew 8, we're just going to read 23 through 25. And it reads this thus. And when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Mark 4, 37 through 39 puts it this way. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat on the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep. But not just asleep, he was sleeping on a pillow. I wonder what kind of pillow they had back then. And the disciples awakened him. And they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Luke 8, 22 through 24 puts it this way. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over into the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water. And they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging water, 
and they ceased, and there was calm. Let me calm down right now. They used the word Jeopardy. Don't you think that would be a good question to have on the TV show Jeopardy? What verse can you find the word Jeopardy in the Bible? Maybe they'll take heed to that. Some of us can sleep through anything. Can you imagine shaking Jesus to wake him up? Why did Jesus come? He came for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to save souls. So does Jesus care about us, our suffering? Yes, he does. Those of us who believe will cast our cares on Jesus. We cannot avoid the trials and tribulations of life, as indicated earlier from the verses, but we can learn to submit unto Jesus and learn the lessons from the trials in our lives. It is an ongoing learning experience to understand what God is teaching us in every trial. Our problems are not going to sink a boat. You hear that? Our problems will not sink the boat. All we need to do is turn our situation, turn that situation over to the Lord. Our problems will now be his problems, and he can take care of our problems. He will fight our battles if we call on him. Storms can be scary. They can be frightening. But remember, Jesus has already overcome death. We may feel helpless. We may feel hopeless. We may even feel useless. But remember, Jesus is here for us. Jesus is not taking the disciples out to see, to drown them. Instead, he has another plan for them. They're going to participate when they arrive on the other side in saving souls, the work of saving souls. So we have to stay focused on what Jesus is doing in our lives. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author, and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and is set down by the right hand of the throne of God. That's the Jesus that we serve. See, storms are everywhere in our lives. And the storm is where you meet Jesus. When you're going through that storm, you will meet Jesus if you call on him. Storms are our pits, P-I-T-S, as in the story of Joseph and the story of Daniel. They were both thrown in the pit, and no one thought that they would survive. But with God on his side, we know the story about Joseph, how he later became second in command of the whole country, and the story of Daniel. Storms will transform us. Now in Matthew 8, 26 and 27, it reads as follows. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful? Why are you afraid? O ye of little faith. Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind. He rebuked the sea. And there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? They were, and this is my word, they were just astonished. They could not believe what they just saw. Mark 4, verse 40 and 41 puts it this way. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were astonished. They couldn't believe what they just saw. And Luke 8, 25 puts it this way. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they being afraid, wondered, saying to one another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and the water, and they obeyed him. My word again for this is astonished. They were astonished. See, Satan is always seeking those who he can devour. 
However, we should be seeking to be transformed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus can calm the storms in our lives. Jesus can do all these things, but all we need to do is take that initiative, take that step, and call on him. One preacher put it this way. To have God in our lives does not mean sailing on a boat without any storm. It means having a boat that no storm can sink. It means having a boat that no storm can make it sink. That brings memory of that big boat they built long ago called the Titanic. Nothing could ever happen to it. No, no, no. It was a marvel. But what happened? We all know that it did sink. You probably saw the movie. In any event, most of the disciples had grown up around the sea. So Jesus is now asking them, why are they fearful? O ye of little faith. The Bible mentions two types of fear. One is the fear of the Lord. Being, that's being in awe of the Lord, where we worship his power and his glory. And the other is found in 2 Timothy 1.7, which reads, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. We can be afraid sometimes, but as long as we trust and we love God completely, we are covered by him. Last week in our lesson about why worry, we discussed that there is no need to worry because God has you right here in the palm of his hand. This same statement is used here to indicate their need to know who is in control. We have to trust in the Lord. So we will all face trials and tribulations. One pastor asked the question, do I really matter to God? And does he care about my problems? We all need to remember that God created us. God redeemed us. God has sealed us to eternity. This is God's love for us. Call on him in the good and the bad times, and he is waiting to hear from you. Amen? Amen. This is a powerful lesson about what we can do to assist others that are in need. And I just wanted to share with you the in focus story uh, in our lesson. So I thought it was pretty good and it applied to a lot that we were covering today. It talks about someone by the name of Shayla. She had gone through a lot in her life. She had lived through a dysfunctional family mental and physical abuse and depression. Yet she found God at an early age and accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. She and her husband Bill tried to obey God in every way. Shayla had known pain and suffering throughout her life, but it was nothing compared to the pain and suffering she experienced when her daughter, Joan, rebelled against God. You see, Joan had grown up in the church, had taught about Jesus and his principles, and she had watched her parents live out those principles every day. She said she had given her heart to God as well. However, when Shayla was diagnosed with breast cancer, soon after her daughter's 14th birthday, Joan turned her back on God, and her rebellion lasted for over 10 years. Shayla could not understand why these things happened. She felt that she and her husband had trained their daughter to, to the nurture and the admonition of God. However, the child still rebelled. Shayla and Bill were rocked almost as much as Joan. But through it all, Shayla and her husband learned to trust in God. So we'll all go through things in life and we will learn to trust in God. They dug their spiritual roots deep into God through prayer, praise, and reading his holy word. And they asked the question, what is your greatest fear? What is your greatest fear? I'll keep that to you. 
Amen. So, just to wind up this lesson, we have to continue to be mindful that God is there for us. He is always waiting to hear from you. I mentioned last week that you can go to Romans 10, 9 if you're not saved. There's a scripture there that tells you just exactly what you need to do. But I like to also point out that we can just use the ABCs of being saved. We can accept the Lord as our Lord and Savior. We can believe in the Lord as our Lord and Savior. And we can confess our sins to this Lord. And if you were to do that, and you find a good Bible-based church, that's what you need to do, and get involved and learn more about God's Word. You know, I have to share my little joke with you today, which is about an elderly couple. The elderly couple noticed they were getting forgetful. He told them to start writing everything down so they would not forget. So he when they got home, the wife asked the husband for a bowl of ice cream. You might want to write it down, she said. He said, I got this. I don't need to write it down. I can remember that. Then she asked him to add some whipped cream. He said, you better write it down. He said, I got this. I don't have to worry about that. Then she asked him, will you have also add a cherry on top? He said, you better write it down, she said. I got this. And then he heads on into the kitchen. Now, in the kitchen, it seemed like it was taking an awfully long time. In fact, it was a little bit more than 30 minutes. Then he returns, and he has a plate of eggs and bacon. The wife stares down at the plate for a moment, and then looks at her husband, and then asks him, well, where's the toast? Where is the toast? Hopefully you got that out there in Wonder Wonderland. All right. So, just to end up this lesson, I'd also like to thank my brother in Christ, Brother uh, Eric Jackson, for his assistance on this lesson. And you know, when you look at all the things that are going on in this world, we have to be mindful that there is a source out there that we can call on. And we know that his name is Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word on this day. Allow it to fill us with hope. Be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you all have a good Sunday. Amen.